Everything Sports Camp is coming up soon. Uh, again, if you would like to help out, you can go to the app. You can click right there, uh, and you can uh, sign up there to help us, or you can go out in the lobby. Uh, again, uh, don't wait, because a lot of us like to go, well, let me see what else happens, or let me see what else is on my schedule, and you wait till like three days before. Uh, we have already 100, over 130 kids signed up. Uh, we sent over 3,000 uh, brochures to the elementary schools home with kids. And so we've got, a, and we still have a month um, to, for sign up. So uh, we would love for you to help us, whether in all the areas, uh, it's just an exciting time. One, to be the light of Christ in our community, to open the doors up uh, for so many kids from our community to come to hear, see, and experience the gospel. Uh, and we'd love your help in that. My name is Walt Tanner, one of the pastors here at Capstone. And we'd just like to tell you, thank you for hanging out with us here on Sunday morning. If you're here or you're watching online, uh, what an awesome honor it is that you're spending today with us. So we are uh, in the deep end of the New Testament. Uh, so we are swimming in Romans uh, this summer. And so we're going to be in Romans 1 to 8, uh, all the way to the beginning of August. And so last week we started this whole journey and we said, look, just to be honest, the start of Romans is uh, offensive and it catches many people off guard because of the way that Paul presents sin. He pretty much says, look, all of us are guilty of sin. All of us, uh, when we sin, it is offensive to God, and so therefore we deserve his wrath. So he starts off by the first couple of chapters of Romans saying, hey, here's why the good news is such good news. Here's why we all need the good news. Unfortunately, too many of us, uh, we kind of get in our church world, and we kind of get in our holy huddle, and we, we get in our bubble, and we forget just how much we need the gospel. We forget how good the good news really is. So we talked about uh, just the understanding of Romans 1, and we heard a lot of comments just from you guys, all positive, thanking you, thanking us for just kind of diving into Romans 1, and because Romans 1 is a tough subject, just to be honest, uh, Romans 1, 26 and 27, um, and, and we wrote, we got right into that and understanding, look, when, when Paul talks about sin, he's not singling out a sin. He's ultimately saying, look, because of Genesis 3, we have all chosen our desires over our design. That's what was, that was the title of our sermon last week, Desire Over Design. Because ultimately, because of sin, God gives us exactly what we want. So we get, God says, okay, well, that's what you want to be a part of, then here you go. I'm going to give you your desires. So he gives us those opportunities. And again, we have a choice. So because of sin, we are, are, we're, desire, we're chasing after our desires, what we long for, versus our design, what God created us for. So let me say that again. We chase after our desires, what we long for, versus our creation of what we were created for, our design of what we were created for. So we talked about, again, Romans 26 to 27. Paul starts with his first sin. He says homosexuality. He talks about same-sex attraction. And again, uh, some people said, I've never heard it addressed the way that we addressed it last, last time. Paul is not saying this as a weaponizing of this sin. He's not saying this is a greater of all the other sin. He is saying, look, naturally, by Biologically, males were created for females. And he says, look, this is the, the natural design versus desires, okay? He does say, look, this is a desire. This is a sin. And a lot of us in church world stop there. We don't keep reading. We, we use that against people and we use that in our debates and our arguments and we stop reading. But we've got to keep reading of what it says uh, in, verse, uh, in verses 28 all the way down to the end of the chapter. It says, look, here's... He says, yes, 26, 27, that is a sin. But then he talks about anger and murder and covenants and lying and envy and gossip and even disobeying parents. And all God's parents said, amen. amen. Our, our children are sinners, all right? It says here, we don't need proof. It says that disobeying our parents. So Paul, again, wasn't saying that homosexuality was the greatest of sin, but it was a sin of many. That is a desire over our design. We were not, cre we were, here's what we were created for. So Paul in chapter two then goes, hey, for the Jews, so that's kind of the unchurched. He's saying, that's the one, they're the, they're, the, um, they're the unchurched, they're the Gentiles. He says, look, even the Gentiles, even though before they step into a church or even before you tell them about me, they can look at a sunset and they can look at the ocean and they can go to the mountains and they can go to the stars and know that something is bigger than them because it has been known to us and been known in us. 
but we all suppress the truth. Why? Because we chase after desires versus our design. That's chapter one. Then chapter two, he says, okay, for you Jews, you think you got it all figured out. You think you're better because you have the law or because you have priests or because you have temples. But he says, look, you do the exact same thing as the unbelievers and the Gentiles do in chapter one. And for us, we said, this is for us church people. So he said, you have the law, the priest, the temple, you have the Bible, Sunday school, mission trips, churches, yet you still are guilty as well. You're just as guilty as the unchurched. We are all without excuse. We have all rebelled against the God. We have all taken part in chasing our desires and not our design. Because here's our design. Our design is to love, not hate. Our design is to have compassion and mercy and not judge. Our design is to worship our creator, not creation. When you begin to look at our design, our design looks a whole lot like Jesus. And that's why Jesus came. That's why God put on human flesh and came in human form, a part of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. He came and he dwelt among us to show what our design should look like. It doesn't mean that there's not temptation. It doesn't mean that there's challenges. But they understand of what it means to be a part of your design. Now, people often argue, well, I should be, if I have a desire, then I should be able to do it. My desires won't lead me astray. I can tell you, Scripture can tell you, and many of us can testify that our, your desires can lead you astray. We talked about when, you're, uh, when you fully develop uh, your, your cortex here, there are many of us that were not fully developed, and we chased our desires, and we have the scars to prove it. We chased after the things that we thought were best and that we desire. I could desire one day, I could wake up and just say, hey, I'm no longer going to be a one-woman man, despite the covenant of marriage telling me I was designed to be a one-woman man. My wife made it wake up and hear that and decide that murder is not that bad of a thing. <laughs> now, I'll tell you all this in confidence. If you tell her I told you this, I'll call you liars. Uh, When we got married, one of the early conversations we had was divorce was not an option that murder was, okay? So she said, I'm not going to divorce you, but murder is on the table, all right? She wasn't created to murder. I wasn't created to cheat. I wasn't created if I decide, hey, I want to steal money from the church. That's my desire because I want to keep up with the Joneses. I want to keep up with, with everybody else. That wasn't my design. My design was to be honest and to be trustworthy. That my desire might be to talk about someone who has wronged me. That's my desire to get back at them. My design is to forgive them and to be like Jesus. Now you begin to see how this design desire thing works. And it's not, not just, let's just not pick out one crowd who, who may choose something different than us. Let's not put up our binoculars and point out everyone else's sin who going, yeah, they're going against their design. They're going against their design. Let's hold up a mirror and begin to look at our own selves and begin, okay, God, where in my life am I going against my desires? I'm going against my design and chasing after my desires. Because here's the truth, is that only through the power of the Holy Spirit are we able to overcome our desires and live in that sweet spot of design. Because sometimes we have desires that go against our design, and sometimes we pray that God would take them away, and sometimes He does, and sometimes He doesn't. Sometimes we live a life, as Paul says, with a thorn in our side. There are sometimes that we have to rely more and more on the Father. We have to rely more and more on Scripture. We have to rely more and more in community because that desire isn't taken, and we desire to live in our design. And so how does that work out? So today in Romans 2... We're going uh, to finish Romans 2 and, and Romans 3. So as we finish Romans 2, Paul says, okay, now I've kind of established this whole argument of pretty much all of us are sinners in need of a Savior. Now here are some excuses or here are some ways that you might think you might beat the system. So let's start with Romans 2, verse 17. I encourage you to open your Bibles or turn on your, uh, turn on your Bible, open up your app. You'll see it along on the screen. If you're at home, we encourage you to follow us along as well. So we're going to be in verse 17 where we stopped Last week, it says, but if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God and know his will and approve his excellence because you are instructed from the law, which basically says you call yourself a Christian and you've been in church and you know the Bible and you've taught Sunday school and you've gone on mission trips, because you've done all those things 
And if you are sure that you are yourself a guide to the blind and a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a children of, uh, teacher of children, having in the law embodied of knowledge and truth, you yourself teach others, do you teach yourself? He says, you're telling these people they shouldn't be doing this stuff, but are you holding up your own mirror? Are you looking at your own heart? While you preach against stealing, you steal. In verse 22, it says, you talk about not committing adultery, you commit adultery. You talk about not worshiping idols, you worship idols. And he keeps going on and on and on. He only says, hey, you call yourself a Jew, but you don't look like a Jew. You don't actually follow the law. So here's your first, as he kind of says, religion doesn't work. So he's saying, look, some people, you're going to lean on the fact that you're a Jew and you're going to say that that title is what saves you. That, that title is what redeemed you. That religion is what, that's what's going to get you into heaven. He says, religion will not work. Paul could be today telling us, well, uh, you say you're Catholic or Baptist or Presbyterian or Methodist or even a Christian. He says, that title isn't what saves you. And that was the issues for the Jews and the Gentiles in Rome. They needed a new heart. Religion couldn't give them that. Everyone between the Jews and Gentiles in Rome 2,000 years ago to the Christians in Fountain Inn today, the understanding that we need a new heart, and religion doesn't do that. Yet many of us still look down on the pagans and we think we're better than them. Why? Because we have religion? Because we follow rules? But ultimately, religion is just simply this. It's man-made rules to feel better about ourselves. Religion is just simply made man, man-made rules to make us feel better about ourselves. It's the idea that, well, as long as I don't do these things, then that must mean I'm okay. So I'm going to follow these rules. It makes me feel better about me. And that's where we rebel against God because now it's more based on me and not God. And that's not the gospel. That's religion. And so as we talk about that, the, the understanding of, well, 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 hold on. Now, Christianity is a world religion. Christianity is a world religion, but understand the difference between Christianity and all of the world religions. All of the world religion is about each individual and their actions, praying a certain time, a certain amount of days, or going to Mecca, or following all the rules to break into Nirvana or everlasting peace or wherever you're going. It's about the individual of religion. And what we're talking about is relationship. Tim Keller, I mentioned him last week. You guys really enjoyed that quote about who gets into heaven and, and understanding what that looks like and how we identify, unfortunately, sin with getting into heaven. But this is totally different on the side, but Tim Keller has a great chart of the difference between gospel and religion. You can, you can Google it. You'll find it. We're going to look at the top three. But here are the top three things, the difference between religion and uh, the gospel. The first you see up on the screen is this, I obey, therefore I'm accepted. That's religion. As long as I follow the rules, then God will accept me. God will love me. The gospel is this. I am accepted, therefore I obey. So what's your motivation of obeying? What is your motivation of doing what you do? Do you do that so that God loves you? Or you do that because you've already been accepted into his family? I talked to one, one person from first service and say, well, and you just kind of shine a light on my heart that for many, many years I have been doing religion. I have been following rules thinking that God loves me more because I follow the rules. And many of us who've been in church entire lives, some of us who've, who've heard this, and unfortunately, we as the church and pastors, we kept people captive because we said, hey, if, as long as you follow rules, you need to listen to me or you need to come to this institution or you need an organization. There's fear that bases are going, hey, I believe the Holy Spirit has you. Therefore, you don't need me. You don't need the church. You have the Holy Spirit. That's what you have. You're accepted by that. And that's why we follow. And that's why we obey of the understanding that what it means to, to love God. Loving God is just simply going, man, I... I you love me, God, because you've already accepted me. It's not me earning your love. It's simply me obeying out of what you've already done. We obey because we've already been accepted, not in order to be accepted. And there's a big difference. One is proving yourself and earning love, which, by the way, if you earn love, you can lose love. All right, I've got to be good enough, got to be good enough, got to be good enough. Oh, I wasn't good enough. Therefore, I'm not accepted anymore. It's One of the things we call about once saved, always saved, because if you don't earn it, guess what? You can't lose it. So the understanding of is that you're accepted who you are no matter what you do. 
Salvation isn't yours to earn, therefore you can't lose. Therefore, salvation isn't about what I've done. It's about what Christ has done. That's the difference between religion, I obey, therefore God loves me, versus, all right, God loves me. How do I know that? Because he sent Jesus. How do I know love Jesus? Jesus loves me because he went to the cross, and that's why I do what I do. All right, so that's the difference in religion and the first one. Number two, I obey God in order to get things from God. I obey God to get God. Now, some conviction just kind of welled up in y'all because y'all been praying that prayer. All right, God, I'm going to do this, this, and this. And God, if I do that, you're going to give me this. God, if I do all the things I'm supposed to do, then I'm going to do that. So that's why I obey. That's why I follow in order to get things from God. It's this entitlement mentality of, okay, God, I deserve it. I did what you told me to do, therefore I deserve it. I should get the raise. I should get the American dream. I should get the easy way out. I, I, I deserve it because I do these things. That's why I obeyed you, God. So therefore, you serve me. Versus I obey God in order to simply get God. I obey God so I can look more and more like him. I simply obey God so I can be Jesus' hands and feet. I obey him because I want to get back to my design. That's why I obey. And whether he gives me everything I want or absolutely nothing, guess what? I still obey in order I get God. And so when you begin to think the difference between religion and gospel, there's a lot of conviction that happens in us. And Paul is telling you, Look, it's not, about, it's not about you earning, and it's not through that religion. And then last but not least, it's our motivation. Religion, motivation is based on fear and insecurity. Gospel is motivation is based on a grateful joy. So many of us, we grew up, and we heard sermons like this. If you were to leave this place tonight, do you know where you spend eternity? We, we basically, they were trying to scare, scare the hell out of us. And the motivation was, hey, I want to get out of hell free card. And many of us walked aisles and we raised our hands and we said, hey, I don't want to go to hell, therefore give me Jesus. The motivation is based in fear and insecurity. But the thing is, is we focus more on where we're going to end up and we don't focus on what God's called us to do and be here. The idea of salvation isn't that I just get to go to heaven when I die. It's the idea that, I'm, I, that I am being made into who God designed me to be here on planet earth, that I love and not hate that I show compassion and mercy and not judge, that I worship creator, not creation. That's the point of the gospel. Not so I get out of hell free card. Because most people who just get, a, get out of hell free card, they actually aren't following Jesus. They're following rules. They're following religion. And the understanding of going, okay, God, if you really love me, it's the understanding that I don't have to do anything. But because you do love me and because I want more of you, I don't want more things, my motivation is a grateful heart of what you've already done and what, you've been given, what I've been given in Christ. It's a rejoicing that I've been invited into his family, that he invites me into this story. He's the main character. I'm a support character. And he says, hey, I want you in this story with me, so let's go do this thing together. And with a grateful heart, I'm saying, thank you for allowing me to be in this. Let's go. Let me be your hands. Let me be your feet. With a grateful joy. We get back to our design, who he created us to be. So he says, look, religion's not going to work. Where there's Christianity, and you just get out of hell free card, you think that's what's going to save you? And y'all, you guys have heard me say this for, for 13 years. If you're new here, you'll hear me say it a lot more. But just because you hang out in a garage does not make you a car. Just because you hang out here does not make you a Christian. That's what many people believe. Well, as long as I go to church, that's religion. As long as I check boxes, that's religion. As long as I follow rules, that's religion. That's not the gospel. All right, so he says religion won't work. The next is this, is that moralism will not work. Moralism will not work. Let me give you a quick definition of what moralism is. I realize I kind of buried this before. Moralism is this, good people doing good things, hoping to go to a good place. Moralism is good people doing good things, hoping to get to a good place. Moralism is probably one of our most, uh, is the largest religion here in America and probably the globe. That we think, hey, as long as we just follow rules and we, we, we're good people. So Paul's like, all right, so, you th- so religion doesn't work. So here's what you might say next. Well, if religion doesn't work and I don't need to go to church, I don't need to go to Sunday school, I don't need to go to mission trips, I don't need to get baptized, I don't need to do any of that, then obviously then I'll just be a good person because my good works will outweigh my bad works. 
And if I have more good than I do bad, then God's going to let me in. That makes sense. And Paul says, no, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way because many of you may have had that conversation with your coworker or your fellow student or a teammate. Said, yeah, I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm better than Uncle Ricky and Pookie, all right? I, I'm better than them, so I must be okay. Or you've had that conversation or maybe even in your own life go, well, you know what? I don't really know if I need that Jesus guy because I'm a pretty good dude. I'm not as bad as her. I don't post that stuff on social media. And the understanding of, well, I'm a pretty good, I don't really know if I need Jesus that much. Remember, the good news is good news. Why? Because we've all fallen short of the glory of God. We have all sinned. We've all done one thing on that list in, in chapter one. The good news is good news. And don't think you're good enough to earn it yourself. And that's ultimately what Paul says. Paul says, all right, you want to go there? We'll go there. We'll dip our toes in there. Let's go back to the Old Testament. He said, let's go back and just look at a few. And, and we're in Romans 3, verse 9 um, through 12. Which, by the way, uh, gathering insights in the back, or if you want to do more in-depth study on all this stuff, they're in the back or on the app. Uh, got great responses from last week's. Um, I encourage you to, to read more of this. 1 through 20 covers all of this. We're just looking at these little verses here. Uh, but during the week, whether it's with somebody at Starbucks or just your time at lunch, dig deeper into Romans. I can't cover it all. I encourage you guys to dig. All right, so we're just going to look at verses 9 through 10. So he says this. So what are they? Are they Jews? Are they any better off? No, not at all. For we've all been charged... That all, both Jew and Greek, are under sin. Both Jew and Gentile are under sin. Both church and unchurched are under sin, as it is written. So now he's quoting the Old Testament. The first one you see up there, he's quoting Psalms 14. He says, None is righteous, no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they all become worthless. No one does good. Not even one. I'm just going to keep reading. It's not on the screen. It says, their throat is like an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. Their venom is like a snake under their lips. Their mouth is full of coarse and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. And their paths are ruined and misery. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before them in their eyes. So here we see Paul saying, look, there's no one. Going back to chapter one. Every single person who's ever walked planet Earth, they are sinners. They're no just good people. And that's the difference between religion and the gospel. Religion is, well, there's good people who follow the rules and bad people who don't. In the gospel, there's only people who don't. Because none of us are righteous. And that's what, that's what that scripture says. None of us are righteous. None of us are good. Not even one. So when you try to do good works apart from Jesus, you're still basically looking out for yourself. And the best of the best of, of a mentality of why you do what you do it's just to pat yourself on the back, to make yourself feel better. You are the center of the story. You're the main character, not God, not what you were created to do. Moralism, again, is the largest religion. When we compare ourselves to others, when we're focused more on doing just better things, that this equals a good life. That's not what, that moralism doesn't work. Because where's the line of who gets in? Like this person had 10,188. This person had 10,187. They don't make it of good works. Who draws the line? How good is good enough? Great book by Andy Stanley. I encourage you to read it if this is something you struggle with. A little book like this big. But moralism doesn't work. And that's what Paul says. He says, look, none of us are good. None of us have pure motives. None of us have it without Christ. Are we able to do and earn that? So if, if religion won't work, we can't follow rules. If moralism won't work and we just can't be good enough, then what is the answer? Well, we get it in uh, verse 21. I told you guys I'm going to write a book. The only book I might write is called uh, The Big Butts of the Bible. This is the biggest butt right here, all right? The biggest butt of the Bible. This paragraph alone, we could spend days, and this is why I tell you to study this on your own. We could spend days of just the, the, the theological and understanding of goodness of what's right here. So he's established chapter one. Those who are outside of the faith of the Jews, they, they're without excuse. The Jews, the religious, the church people, they're without excuse. He says, and you're trying to say religion will save you? That won't work. You're trying to say good works will save you? That won't work. He says, but, so here's the answer, but now the righteousness of God has been manifest apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness, here's it is, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory in God. And all are justified by his grace as a gift 
through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as propitiation by his blood. We do not have time. We can spend a month on what that word means and, and the understanding of your forgiveness that comes through his blood. To receive by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he has passed over former sins. So he has forgiven sins. So what purifies our sins? It is not our religion, our following rules. It is not our good works or being just a good person. It is in Christ and Christ alone. And that's your last point, in Christ and Christ alone. So here we, we get the understanding that religion won't save us. But Jesus is better than religion, and Jesus is better than moralism. Jesus is why it's called good news. All the other things are based on me. Religion is about me following rules. Moralism is about me being a good person. But Christ is the good news. Verse 22, he says this. Let me read it again. Oh, it's way over here. All right, 22. And if you're, if, I highly encourage you to underline this. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus for all who believe, for there is no distinction. There's no distinction. It's not Jew or Gentile. It's not black or white. It's not rich or poor. It's not old or young. There is no distinction. There's no distinction in the salvation. Why? Because all are sin and all have fallen short of the glory of God. None of us are right. None of us are righteous. And then he says, and we've been justified. How are we justified? By his grace as a gift. Justified means this, just if I'd never sin. Justified. Which means that list from, from, from Romans 1 or this list that we see in Colossians or the list we see in Ephesians or the list we see in 1 Corinthians that Paul lists out, hey, you can't get into heaven because of this list. He says, you are justified is just if I've never sinned by his grace that is a gift. It is a gift that you don't deserve. It is a gift that you cannot earn. It is a gift that you simply accept. Now, I know for some of you, there's some tension because you come from a world where, no, 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 well, I've got to be better. I've got to do more. That's not the gospel. That's not what Paul is saying. Paul is saying it is a free gift in Christ alone. And Paul will spend the rest of Romans unpacking that one little paragraph. We'll spend the next six weeks unpacking it. But understand it is by his grace and not by our works that is given to us. It is not something we are entitled to. We as Americans, we think that we are entitled if God loves me, then, then he should give me what I want. If God loves me, then there, I shouldn't have any hardship. If God loves me, then it should work out this way. We know God loves us because he sent us a way out of our desires. He sent us a way out of being in bondage. He gave us a way out, and it's not based on my, on my religion. It's not based on my good works. It is based on the good works of Christ and Christ alone. And that should be freeing. And it took me a while to kind of break some of those chains, even from my, for the way I grew up. But going, you know what? Even if I don't read my Bible this morning, God still loves me just the same. And there's been, now, do I read my Bible? Yes, because I want to. Why? Because I want more of God, because I want more of him. I, I want that more. But whether I do or don't is not dependent on how much God loves me. And we've got too entangled in the idea of self-righteousness versus understanding that he has given us his righteousness Righteousness, the word righteous means it comes from right with God. The only way for us to be made righteous is in Christ alone. In Christ alone, our re redeemed, our redemption comes. And that's what Paul says in verse 24. He says, redemption has come. That redemption comes from the Old Testament. And it's an agricultural term. So in agriculture and farming, it's very easy to be indebted to someone because if you, you have one season that doesn't get a harvest crop or there's one season or two of drought, you're not able to pay back the man who gave you the money for the seed or whose land you're working. So you become indebted to them. Redemption comes from your debt being paid in full. That you're no longer, you're no longer in debt to anyone. Freedom from the debt no longer in bondage. And that's what he said. You're no longer in bondage to those desires. You now have the freedom. You now have a choice. You can choose your desires or you can choose your design. But God says, you now choose. I've given you a way out. I've given you the key. The, cho the choice is, will you accept that free gift? That we come back to our design to be righteous. So here's our big idea. 
you're new to Capstone or you're watching for the first time, we try to give a big idea where it summarizes kind of what we've talked about, more conversation starters for you to, to say, hey, here's what I'm learning at church or to post on social media or to have conversations about. It's just simply this. Religion and moralism won't make us right with God. It will only be through Christ alone that makes us righteous. Now, some of us, we, we, there's some conviction, and, and you may need to just spend some time just kind of talking this out with the Lord. And someone, again, someone who came and said, I was taught the wrong way for most of my life, that I felt like I've been in bondage in church. I've carried this weight of religion. And Paul says, that's not the gospel. The gospel is that you're free. You're free. There's freedom in Christ. John uh, 15 says this. He says, they're going to know you're my disciples by the fruit that you bear. Now, Paul says, look, by name tag, you said you guys are good Jews, but you actually don't do what it says. There's fruit in our life. So what does that fruit look in your life? Does your fruit look more like religion and there's self-righteousness and there's pride and you putting up binoculars and pointing out everybody else's sin? Or is it holding up a mirror going, man, God, thank you that I'm able to look at my own sin and my own struggles and my own vice and my own things that I deal with and giving me the power to overcome that, giving me the power to wrestle with that versus the idea of self-righteousness. Is that the fruit of your life of religion or is the fruit the gospel of hope in Christ, in freedom in the inheritance that we receive. Not just to get out a hell free card, I just carry around and go to church and check a box. What is the fruit in your life that you're growing closer and closer in Christ? Not because you have to, but you get to. That you get to be more and more like him, that he's invited you into this story. He's invited you into his redemptive story of bringing hope, of sharing, and the understanding that the pressure should be off of you as you tell the story of the gospel. You, it's not your response. As long as you share the story of Jesus, it's not your job to save anybody. That's, that's the Holy Spirit. So you should not go, well, Walt, I don't, I don't tell anybody about Jesus because I think I'll get it wrong. No, no. We're all sinners in need of a Savior. All have fallen short of the glory of God. We're justified in Christ alone. Next week, we'll talk about by faith alone of what it looks like going, the freedom, the freedom that I can talk about Jesus is amazing. And the weight isn't on me. It's not my job to save anybody. But it is, I have been invited to share the story. I have been invited to be his hands and feet. I have been invited to take care of the least of these. I have been invited to disciple others. I have been invited to this. The question is, what will we do? Will we be in bondage of, of religion and just kind of follow the the rules and just kind of go through the, the mundane of checking off boxes and, and get grumpy and become those people who nobody wants to be with because you're judging and, and just kind of casting stones? Are people going, man, by the way, Jesus never wondered, I wish I had lost people to hang out with. Sitting at Starbucks going, man, if I just knew somebody who didn't know me. Why? Because lost people loved Jesus. Like he, he listens to me. Woman caught in adultery, drug out, maybe naked, maybe with just a, he, he says, hey, you without the first stone, you cast on this young lady. And he looks at her with tears in her eyes and maybe even in his eyes. He says, hey, you know what you've done? Don't do it again. Take the narrow path that is, ne- that is difficult. Don't take the broad road. Jesus always had grace and compassion for those in sin. His wrath was for those religious leaders who thought they were better than other people. So as we talk about religion and gospel, Paul's laying out an argument of going, hey, here's why the good news is so good news. It's, it's not about what you've done. It's what about what Christ has done. And the rest of Romans is unpacking this beautiful Romans 3 paragraph of justification and sanctification and glorification of who you're called to be in Christ, in Christ alone. That's the joy of following him. So where are you in that story? If you don't know Jesus and you're the first, it's the first time you're hearing this good news and this is exciting you and your heart's pounding about 100 miles an hour, please come see me or maybe someone you came with and we'd love to tell you that story of what it means to follow Jesus. Not religion, not rules, not works, but truly submit to King Jesus. If you're here today and you've been convicted, go, man, I've been getting this all kind of backwards. Confess that to the Lord. God, I want the, I want the chains of religion to fall off and I really want the gospel to be the fruit of my life. If you're here and you're just excited about the gospel, hey, who are you sharing it with as a missionary where you work, learn, live, and play? 
Where's that fruit in your life that people know that you're a Christ follower? They know, not because you judge them, but because you love them. Not because, not, not because you hate them or are angry at them, but because you are showing patience. You just simply have a listening ear. I think that is, the longer I do this, and the longer the things that we're seeing in the world, the greatest thing the church can do at this point is not hold more protests and not more boycotts. It's simply listen. Simply listen. And I think that's what Jesus does a lot of in the New Testament. He, people come to him. Crowds come to him. Why? Because they want to hear his truth, but also so they can tell their story. And Jesus can simply listen and point them to the Father. And that's our job. Let's listen and then point people to the Father. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you now thanking you that our salvation and our justification is not based on how good we are, how well we follow rules, because Paul makes a pretty clear case. We can never follow enough rules and we can never do enough good works. That it really is simply about the work of Christ on the cross. And as we'll talk about the rest of this series, it is by his blood alone and his power of the resurrection that we're even able to have life. Lord, if there's someone here today who does not know you, I pray, or they're watching today and they do not know you, I pray they would talk to myself or other leadership here at the Cap, at Capstone or, or just simply they know someone who's a Christ follower and they would simply tell them what it really means to follow Jesus. Not rules, not religion, but to follow Christ. Well, I pray for my Capstone family and just the impact we're already seeing just by simply being the hands and feet of Jesus. And we know it's difficult and we know it's challenging. It's becoming more and more challenging. It is harder and harder to be Christ follower because the Christ follower, Jesus, your ways are not matching up with culture. Your words are not matching up with the world says is right and the desires of this world. But God, I pray that we would have courage and still speak truth. That we would not be fearful of what other people may say or think about us when we present the gospel, when we simply share the truth. And we know that we all are sinners, that we not live a hypocritical life to think that, that none of us have sin. Paul makes it very clear, we all do. May we not think we're better because we quote unquote go to church and other people don't. But I pray you just stir inside of us, what do, what do we need to be doing? Maybe it's, we don't need to be doing anything. Maybe we just need to be being, being you, being Christ. We're not human doers. We're human beings. May we be and we sit at your good, when we sit at your feet, may we exhale ourselves in our desires and may we inhale our design to love, have mercy and compassion and grace. May we continue to tell your story by the lives that we live. Not a life of hypocrisy, maybe a story of brokenness. That we were, we're not who we are because of our good works. We're not who we are because we pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. We're not who we are because we tried really hard. We are who we are because of you, Jesus. And may we never be satisfied with status quo. May we never be satisfied that we're quote unquote good enough. You have called us to a journey becoming more and more like you. Love you, Lord. Praise you. Thank you that you've given us this opportunity to hear your word today and may it not come back void. In your sense, holy name we pray. Amen. We are so glad that you joined us this morning online to worship with your Capstone family. This was the big idea. Religion and moralism won't make us right with God. Only through Christ alone will make us righteous. Again, thanks so much for joining us online today. We would love to get in touch with you, so if you would comment below, send us a DM, follow us on social media, or head to our website, capstonechurch.net, we'd love to hear from you. We'd also love to see you in person at our next gathering. We meet every Sunday at 9 and 1045 at Capstone Church in Fountain. You're sent out.